All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, welcome to another control seminar. Um, uh, our guest today is Chris Vermillion. Uh, Chris uh, got his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan in 2009. Uh, he also got his undergraduate degrees here, both aerospace as well as mechanical engineering uh, uh, earlier than that. Um, and uh, he's uh, he worked in uh, industry for a few years in automotive powertrain control, as well as in lighter than air wind, wind energy. Uh, he's uh, currently an associate professor at NC State. Uh, his research interests are uh, in dynamic, uh, dynamics design control of airborne and wind energy systems, uh, and also marine hydrokinetic energy systems, which I believe is what he's gonna tell us about today. Uh, and uh, also he works on connected and automated vehicles. Uh, uh, so he's a, a recipient of many awards, uh, including the NSF Career Award in 2015, uh, as well as uh, uh, a number of uh, teaching awards, both from UNC Charlotte, where he was for a, for a time, as well as from NC State. So uh, uh, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Chris to the University of Michigan. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you for hosting me for this talk. It's uh, great to be back giving another control seminar. And uh, and thanks to everyone who uh, who braved the rather chilly November way, November day to come out uh, live to see me talk about underwater kites. Uh, I come from uh, NC State in Raleigh, North Carolina. So if we had this light dusting of snow uh, in, in Raleigh, forget about it. Everything would be shut down. It'd be pandemonium. Cars would be in the ditches. And uh, uh, there would be no seminar. Uh, I appreciate the, the, I guess this is being recorded. Nothing against uh, against Raleigh, but you people are tough. Uh, I'd like to talk today about energy harvesting kites, specifically cyclic motion control of kites. But I want to start by taking a, a step back from that and telling you a little bit about who I am and, and what I do more broadly. So um, my lab is the core lab, control and optimization for renewables and energy efficiency. And um, I might be biased, but I like to think that uh, I work in two of the most exciting areas of our time, one being energy and the other being control and autonomy. This slide here gives a little bit of a perspective of, of the portfolio of applications that we work on in the lab. Um, the applications that I'm gonna talk about today relate largely to the pictures that you see in this upper row. And what you see here are what are called energy harvesting kites. Uh, some of them, the first two are harvesting energy in the, whoops, in the air. Um, and then these three are underwater kites. And the whole idea of these is to be able to harvest either very high altitude wind resources or ocean currents and tidal resources that may be in very deep waters or waters with very deep seabed with very, very little material and get really a lot of power with a little material. And I'll talk about how we do that in a moment. It's not the only thing that, that our lab works on, although it's probably our largest portfolio of applications now. As Jeff mentioned, we do a lot of work on connected and autonomous vehicles. We've been part of the ARPA-E NextCar program. We focused on um, leveraging connectivity and autonomy to improve fuel economy significantly for heavy duty diesel trucks. Um, one of the areas of research that I'm more recently involved in is something that I call mission planning and control for renewably powered robotic vehicles. Um, the idea here is that if you take a mobile robotic vehicle and you power it solely or principally through a renewable resource like a wind resource over here or a solar resource, then from a mission planning and control standpoint, you really turn a traditional mission planning and control paradigm on its head where traditionally you're faced with relatively predictable mobility, but very limited range. Well, in this setting, you've got infinite range, but you have stochastic mobility. And it turns out that that introduces a lot of, a lot of unique mission planning and control challenges. And this is a, a more recent area of our research. But like I said, this talk is about kites. I'm gonna focus primarily on underwater kites and to whet people's appetite here. Here are a few images of underwater kite systems. The top three images here are different kite designs um, that were developed by a Swedish company called Monesto, probably the leader in the development of underwater kites. Um, although there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done in terms of mission planning and, and, and control. And, and that's sort of where we fit in. This is a picture of a, a kite prototype that we did toe testing on in the NC State pool. This is a picture, by the way, of a 
prototype kite system that's morphable that can actually change its physical geometry in response to the environment. Um, the idea of energy harvesting kites is at least at a surface level simple. You take a high lift to drag wing, we call that the kite, you tether it and you fly that in very fast orbits perpendicular to the flow. And by doing that, you can generate a lot of energy with very little material. I'm gonna explain why that is. Um, but first, let me give you an outline of, of how I want to lay out the rest of this presentation. So, yeah, there's a question in the back. Uh, what is the operating depth of this kite? We'll, we'll, uh, there, I promise that won't be the only, uh, the only level of detail, but, but it can be highly variable. Um, so it's a, it's a good question. It depends on whether you're deploying off the seabed or off a floating platform. Um, and it depends on the flow characteristics in, in, in that location. Uh, Here's how I'd like to, to structure the talk. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the, the why and the how behind tethered energy harvesting systems. Um, and what we're going to see is that there's a lot of potential from energy harvesting kites, both airborne and underwater. Um, but in order to realize that potential, you really have to develop controllers that operate efficiently in cyclic manners. And so we're gonna look at some adaptive control strategies and some optimal control strategies for optimizing that cyclic control. And then I'm gonna finish by talking about some of the experimental validation work that we've done. So let's start by talking about why we would want to harvest marine energy in the first place. So this is a graphic that was put together by the DOE that uh, a lot of people reference. Um, put together by N NREL, funded by the, the DOE. Um, and this graphic shows the technical power potential, that is uh, the amount that we expect that with an engineered system or multiple engineered systems, you'd actually be able to extract um, of, of US marine energy resources. So we're talking about ocean current resources, tidal resources, wave resources, and riverine resources. Um, and when you add them up, when you add it up, you get the equivalent of about 200 million homes, 207 million homes worth of energy, to put it in perspective. Now, in terms of the end user of that energy, it's not necessarily going to be utility scale. Some of this energy resource is in very remote areas. Um, so in addition to being able to power homes with this vast renewable resource, there's also something that's talked about a lot in the DOE called the blue economy. And this is off-grid applications offshore, things like autonomous underwater vehicles, things like desalination platforms, things like powering observational buoys. That blue economy constitutes what's estimated to be between a three and a six trillion dollar per year economy that can be, sort, uh, can be supported by marine hydrokinetic energy. But if you know something about marine hydrokinetic energy, you know it's not at this point at least being adopted in mass. And so one could ask, why is that the case? And, and I would make the argument that one of the critical challenges facing marine hydrokinetic energy systems, and this is kind of true across the board, whether you're talking about wave, tidal, or current, is that they are burdened by bulk bulkiness, as I like to say. So I'm going to be focusing on harvesting tidal resources and current resources predominantly in this presentation. And so we'll just do a, a little analysis based on tidal and current resources over here. Uh, the nice thing about Harvesting tidal energy is the same physical mechanism that's used to harvest tidal energy can be used to harvest wind energy, a turbine. Um, so the turbine, a turbine has some swept area and can generate some amount of power per swept per unit swept area. And that's going to go as half times the density of the flow times the flow speed cubed times a power coefficient. And so we could do a little comparison in terms of power per swept area between wind and then tidal or current energy in both a moderate flow environment of about two meters per second. That's at the high end of what you could get somewhere like the Gulf Stream. A lot of tidal streams have that available. And a lower flow environment, which is available at a lot of, a lot of locations of one meter per second. What we see is actually in terms of that metric, we do all right in terms of underwater energy. We get more power density, a lot more power density at a moderate flow speed. And comparable density to wind at, at a lower flow speed that's going to be present at a lot more locations. The story gets a little uglier, a lot uglier actually though, when you start looking at, at metrics that are more relevant in terms of cost drivers like power per unit mass and what we call the LCOE or the levelized cost of energy. That's the cost 
of, of the device, both including the capital cost of installing the device and building the device and the operations cost over the lifetime of, of the device, the operational expenses um, per unit kilowatt hour, per, per unit energy. And so if we look at a comparison between some, some tidal reference model turbines here, a tidal reference design from the ARPA eSharks project and, and an ocean current reference model, and we compare it to the GE one and a half megawatt wind turbine, what we can see is we're lower in terms of power to mass ratio because we have to put a lot of mass in the water to get a particular amount of power. And we're very high in terms of the estimated LCOE, level, levelized cost of energy. And so this is where we really need, in order to be competitive, we really need to design devices that harvest a lot of power with very little material. And this is where kites come in. So like I said before, the idea of an energy harvesting kite, and really whether you deploy it in the air or underwater, this is the idea, is you take a high lift to drag wing, that's your kite, and you fly it in periodic tethered wing, you fly it in periodic orbits perpendicular to the prevailing flow. And the kite can be deployed if it's underwater off of a floating platform or off of a seabed platform. And by flying it perpendicular to the prevailing flow in these periodic orbits, you can fly many times faster than the flow speed, and you can generate an order of magnitude more power per unit mass, per unit, any measure of unit of material than a stationary system would be able to generate. By the way, this looping video here is, is an example of a tow test that we did, and, and we'll see a couple uh, additional videos in this presentation of a small scale kite in the NC State pool. So. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm making an assertion without a whole lot of evidence that you can generate a lot of energy with a very little amount of material with, with an underwater kite or an airborne kite. Um, I want to get into just a little bit of the physics as to why that's the case. And, and to understand that, it helps to take a quick look at this diagram over here. And this diagram is the basis of a really fairly simple quasi-static analysis. So in this diagram, we're looking down on the page here. The flow is going from the left to the right, and V sub C is the kite's velocity vector. So it's flying perpendicular to the flow. Now, in this quasi-static analysis, the kite is neither accelerating nor decelerating. And if that's the case, then the tether, the sorry, the fluid dynamic forces, the lift and drag forces, when summed together, have to be along the length of the tether. Either otherwise, the, the kite is going to accelerate or decelerate. And so V sub C is the kite's velocity vector. V sub W is the flow velocity vector. And the, the vector difference of the two is something we call the apparent flow velocity. Um, by definition, lift is perpendicular to the apparent flow. Drag is parallel to the apparent flow. And, and what you get from this analysis is two similar triangles. The upshot of which is that the ratio of flight speed to flow speed that you can achieve from the kite is going to be the same as the ratio of lift to drag. A high lift to drag kite is going to enable flight significantly faster than prevailing flow. And you can easily achieve lift to drag ratios of five or more for a kite system. That means you can fly five times as fast as the flow speed. Now, how does that translate into power output? Well, there's two ways you can get power out of a kite system. One is shown over here. It's called onboard generation. Some people call it fly gen. And then what's shown over here is something called ground-based generation or ground gen. So with a fly gen system, what you do is you instrument your kite with rotors and generators, and the power is transmitted to the ground over a conductive cable. With ground gen, there's no generators, there's no rotors on the kite itself. Instead, the tether is spooled out under very high tension, flying in periodic orbits, very fast periodic orbits, and then it's spooled in under very low tension, and this is repeated cyclically. So it turns out if you plug in that relationship from the last slide that the ratio of the kite speed to the flow speed is going to go as the lift to drag ratio of, of the kite. And by the way, this drag number has to account for dra the drag not only from the kite, but also the tether, which is, can become important. What you can do is you can calculate the available mechanical energy in both of the generation modes. And, and the interesting thing here, is that you get the same answer on both sides, regardless of how you do the power generation. There's advantages and disadvantages to each, but the fundamental relationship remains the same. And a key variable in here is this lift coefficient cubed over drag coefficient squared. 
If you make that large, you can generate huge amounts of power from an energy harvesting kite. Um, and so high lift to drag ratios, or strictly speaking, CL cubed over CD squared is gonna result in very high power generation. And we'll talk about some comparisons in a moment to, to uh, stationary systems. But of course, none of that analysis tells you how you actually fly in those periodic orbits perpendicular to the prevailing flow. It doesn't tell you how to maintain an angle of attack to keep that lift to drag ratio high. It doesn't tell you when to spool out, when to spool in, how fast to spool out, how fast to spool in if you're using that mechanism for energy harvesting. And that's where we have to start talking about the control mechanisms under the hood. So what I'm gonna show you in this section of the presentation are a lot of control challenges, three in particular. So whether three is a lot, I don't know, but I'm gonna show you three. Um, and I'm gonna show you a number of simulation results. Experimental results will come later in the presentation. Um, now, the simulation results will, will, will look at things like power output. And uh, in order for that to make sense, it's gotta be contextualized. So for the most part, with the exception of one set of simulation results, and I'll point that out when we get there, we're gonna be looking at this as our nominal design, just to give you an idea of how big a system we're, we're working with here. So we're looking at wing dimensions of 10 meter span by a one meter cord, so 10 square meters, it's a pretty high aspect ratio wing kite. You can go lower than that, but a 10 square meter uh, wing, um, this gives you the dimensions of the stabilizers. The fuselage is eight meters long, by the way. The mass of the tethered system is under a thousand kilograms. Um, and this will generate in the water at one and a half meter per second flow, 100 kilowatts. Now, by comparison, if you deploy a stationary turbine with the same rotor swept area as this wing area, you'll generate less than 10 kilowatts. In fact, around seven kilowatts or so. So that gives you an idea of how much more you can generate with the kite. In terms of running simulations, all the simulation results that you're gonna see are gonna be based on a model that has these characteristics. So the lifting body, the kite itself is, is modeled as a rigid six degree of freedom lifting body. Um, the way that we model it is, is the kite itself is neutrally buoyant and the kite sees hydrodynamic forces at each of these red dots here. So each of the surfaces is modeled independently that allows us to take under consideration the fact that we can have spatial variations in the flow profile. And that a kite is attached to a tether. The tether is modeled as a chain of links and nodes. So masses are concentrated at the nodes. Um, those are black. And then the links are nonlinear spring dampers that can't take compression. Um, so those characterize the dyneema in this case of the tether. So what are these control challenges that I keep talking about? Well, if we wanna fly the kite efficiently, and realize the control potential, the performance potential that I talked about, we've got to do three things. First of all, we've got to fly in these periodic orbits perpendicular to the flow. They can be figure eights, they can be ellipses, but they've got to be efficient, and we've got to be able to track them. Second thing, we have to fly them fast. Given a turbine control strategy, if we have turbines on board, or given a spooling strategy, we want to fly the path as fast as possible possible without overloading the kite structurally. So the first challenge by and large from an aircraft standpoint falls in the, under the category of lateral flight control, whereas the second is longitudinal flight control. The third thing is we have to extract power. Um, and remember I said there's two ways of extracting power. One is through onboard turbines. The other is through cyclic spooling through a winch system at the ground station. We're gonna, we're gonna focus on the second mechanism but the reality is there are cyclic challenges associated with both. But when you're doing spooling-based power generation, you have to answer the question, when do you spool out? When do you spool in? How fast do you spool out? How fast do you spool in? And of course that spooling operation is happening in a cyclic manner. So let's talk about how we, we answer these questions. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna provide six slides, which I'm gonna call teaser slides, um, because I'm gonna partially answer each of those questions uh, but I'm going to leave you hanging and I'm going to tell you exactly what question I'm leaving you hanging on. So first challenge was we have to define it or track a define and track. We got to do both a desirable path. Um, so there's two, two types of flight paths we generally focus on um, either elliptical flight paths shown over on that left GIF or figure eight flight paths shown on this right GIF here. By the way, what you're seeing in this simulation here, not only are you seeing the, the kite flying around and around, 
but you're seeing this uh, this sphere that's getting larger and smaller in kind of this nauseating fashion, and you're hoping that I advance the slides so this thing goes away. Um, what that sphere is here is, is what we call the instantaneous sphere that the kite's flying on. So the kite is, of course, tethered. Its tether length defines a sphere, an imaginary sphere that, that the kite is always flying on. And the kite's position, by the way, on that sphere, just like your position on the Earth, can be described by spherical coordinates, a radius of the sphere, a latitude, and the longitude. For the kite system, we call latitude elevation angle, and we call longitude azimuth angle. Um, but what you're seeing is this sphere getting bigger and smaller because the tether is getting stretched. The tether's pulling, yep. So these patterns are actually happening on the surface. Is that correct? The patterns are on the surface of the sphere, right. The patterns are described by elevation and azimuth angle, so latitude and longitude. So uh, they're on the surface of whatever sphere the kite feels like flying on at that instant, basically, because they're, they're totally parameterized in terms of elevation and azimuth. So this is kind of what I was describing verbally here. To understand how we, how we actually track one of these paths, um, we have to understand a couple of critical angles. And, and the first two, uh, the first angle is something we call the velocity angle. So I, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned azimuth and elevation angle. Here they are graphically. So phi is the azimuth angle. That's equivalent to longitude. Theta is equivalent to latitude. That's the elevation angle. The velocity angle is the direction of the kite's velocity vector on that imaginary sphere on that small Earth. So that's an important variable for getting back on a target path. The other important variable is something we call the tangent roll angle. So the way that the kite can move up or down on that sphere is by redirecting its lift vector. And so you can see it here. If the kite rolls into the sphere, it redirects the lift vector such that there's a component going up the sphere. If it rolls the other direction, there's a component going down the sphere. Now, this is fundamentally not so different than how aircraft lateral control takes place. We're just doing it on the tethered kite, and we're doing it on a much smaller sphere, um, which makes the control a little bit challenging. But here's how it works. We use a hierarchical structure where at the top level of the hierarchy is a path falling controller. Um, so we take in a path geometry, which in this diagram here comes out of thin air. So that's something that we'll probably be addressing in a moment. And we use that and some feedback from the plant to determine a desired velocity angle, that angle. Which direction do we want to be going? Based on that desired velocity angle and feedback from the plant, we compute a desired tangent roll angle. And we convert that desired tangent roll angle along with angle of attack set point and side slip set point to a desired moment vector. And a control allocation matrix converts that into control surface deflections. For this kite, we use ailerons, a rudder, and elevators, just like a, a traditional aircraft would. So one key question here, I've said nothing about where this path geometry comes from, except for the fact that it comes out of thin air. So you may expect some subsequent slides talking a little bit about that, but let's go to challenge number two before we get that. Challenge number two is fly the kite fast without overloading it, and the key variable to doing that there is the kite's angle of attack. So <laughs> if you're from the aerospace world, the angle of attack, strictly speaking, is the angle that's made when you take the apparent flow vector, you project it onto the aircraft's longitudinal plane, and you take the angle between that projection and the cord line of the wing. And so it's drawn over here in two dimensions. Here's the cord line of the wing. That's the, the length of the wing. That's the red line there. Here's the apparent flow vector as projected into the same plane. And the angle between them is the angle of attack. That's a critical driver of performance. And the reason it's a critical driver is because remember a couple slides ago, the, the important driver of power was that lift coefficient cubed over drag coefficient squared. Well, that's predominantly impacted by the angle of attack. So the question is, how do we optimize and track an angle of attack profile? So there's a couple of options for doing that. So let's say that we know the optimal angle of attack profile here, which again comes out of thin air. So you may expect us in later slides to have to address that. Well, um, what we can do here, because we don't want to overload the kite, is we can take our measured tension 
and use a tension limiting controller to set a maximum allowable angle of attack. Now, under most circumstances, that's going to be a very high number. And when we take the minimum of these two values, our desired angle of attack is going to be equal to that which optimizes performance. And we use a standard feedback controller in order to set delta sub B. This is the elevator deflection. So the elevator is on the horizontal stabilizer. It controls the pitch. Another variant that we can do here is if we don't have a good measurement of angle of attack, and we often don't in operation, we can directly set the elevator deflection. So we may know, again, out of thin air, the optimal elevator deflection. We use our tension limiting controller to set a maximum allowable value of that, which usually will be higher than this, but sometimes will be lower in high flow conditions. Take the minimum of the two and set the elevator deflection. Okay, so how do we compute these? So initially, it may seem like this is not that hard of a problem. Because look, here's our, here's our equation for power generated. And lift is a function of angle of attack. Drag is a function of angle of attack. Well, OK, do a fluid dynamic characterization of your kite. Figure out the value of alpha that maximizes this quantity here and control to that value of alpha. Or if you don't have a good measurement of alpha, figure out the mapping between elevator deflection and alpha and figure out the, the optimal value. Well. There's a couple of challenges with that. First of all, this is a quasi-static analysis that results in, in this equation here. So although from a quasi-static perspective, this may be the optimal angle of attack, whatever optimizes this, whatever maximizes this, it may not be optimal from a dynamical standpoint. Um, the other challenge is characterizing these functions, particularly in light of the fact that your drag coefficient depends on things like the tether, um, which counts toward drag performance of the system, is challenging. And if this is off, if this characterization is off, then alpha star is going to be off and you're going to have a suboptimal controller. And so we're going to actually look in future slides into using iterative learning to actually learn that optimal profile. Final challenge, we've got to extract power. So as I mentioned earlier, there's two ways of extracting power. One is with onboard rotors. The other is with cyclic spooling. And in this presentation, I focus on the cyclic spooling. So there's kind of two flavors of cyclic spooling that you can do. Now, one is called multi-cycle flight. And the idea of multi-cycle flight or multi-cycle spooling is probably a better term, is when you're spooling tether out, you fly multiple figure eights. That's what you see happening in the GIF right now. Now, once you've completely spooled tether off, out, you suspend figure eight flight which we should get to in a moment here, and you spool in under very low tension. There it is, it's happening right now. The other thing you can do is something called intracycle spooling. And the idea here is if you wanna target a specific tether length and not be varying the tether length significantly, you can take each figure eight and divide it into spool out and spool in sections. And if you look at this GIF here, you can see green traces and red traces on the GIF. Everywhere you see green, that's where the tether is being spooled out. Everywhere you see red, is where it's being spooled in. So either way, you're generating power on the way out, you're, re you're requiring power on the way in, and obviously what you generate needs to exceed what you require, and you can modulate that through angle of attack, you can modulate that through the flight path. So ultimately, the cyclic spooling is handled whether you're doing multi-cycle or intracycle through a state machine. It's a four-state state machine, when you're doing multi-cycle spooling because you actually have to suspend figure eight flight prior to spooling back in um, and you have to pause prior to entering into to figure eight flight when you spool out and that introduces two additional states you only have two uh two states in the state machine for intracycle spooling now what i would note is what's not addressed here is the question of what are the thresholds for when you spool in and when you spool out and at what speeds should you spool in and out? So here's a little summary of all those control challenges that I presented all these teaser slides for. Challenge number one was to find and track a desirable figure eight or elliptical orbit. Well, the, the flight path, the target flight path in that block diagram came out of nowhere. So we need to talk a little bit about how we optimize it. The second challenge was fly fast. Um, well, we know how to track an angle of attack profile, but how do we select the profile, particularly if we don't have a great model of the fluid dynamics? And it has to be very, very good in order to use the model since that CL is getting cubed and the CD is getting squared in that power equation. 
The third challenge is extract power. And like I said, we've got to figure out when do we spool out, when do we spool in, and how fast. So there's kind of two categories of control strategies that we focused on, candidate tool sets, really, that we focused on in addressing these challenges. So one is tools from continuous time optimal control. I'm talking about I'm talking about things like Pontryagin's maximum principle, where you set up the state equation, set up the corresponding co-state equations, compute the Hamiltonian, and use that in order to derive an optimal control law. This can be quite challenging for the kite system. The kite system is a highly nonlinear system. There are 12 state variables for the kite itself, and then every node along that tether introduces three additional state variables. So highly complex, highly nonlinear system, but from time to time, we can simplify a model down and come up with a, a meta model, as we call it, that actually allows us to apply these tools. And we'll see one instance of that. Um, what we often do, though, if we're not super confident in our model or it's just too complex to use for continuous time optimal control, is we'll look at using repetitive or iterative learning control tools in order to maximize a power metric. So this is something that I've worked on with Kira Barton, where we've taken traditional iterative learning, and instead of using iterative learning in order to optimally or in order to track a prescribed reference, we instead use the iterative learning to maximize an economic objective. In this case, that economic objective is a cycle average power output of the kite. And so I want to go through each of those challenges one by one here and, and address the rest of the story. Talk about how we either use online learning or how we use continuous time optimal control to address the challenge. First challenge was how do we define that flight path? And so what we do here is a variant of economic iterative learning control here, which is going to be shown in a block diagram that's going to animate itself. We perform an iteration. We measure a reward from that iteration. And we update a response surface based upon that reward, which allows us to update our reference trajectory or reference path. And then we use ILC to update the control trajectory to track that reference. And if this works, the reward continues to go up as we perform the iteration. So, so there's a couple of basic control methodologies that we use for this. One is an error-based approach where there's always an estimated optimal uh, reference path or set of basis parameters that describe a reference path. And we make our adjustment based on the deviation from that path and then an excitation term. Uh, the other option is a gradient-based approach. But either way, what we have is something that has the form of an ILC update law, but is driven by a response surface rather than driven by a tracking goal. So this just goes under the hood a little bit into the gradient-based uh, approach here, where we define our path shape through a bunch of basis parameters, as we call those, uh, as we call them, B sub I. And then we have an economic performance index, which we denote J sub I. So I is the iteration number. Our economic performance index is a cycle average power. So we're focused on mechanical power, which is tension times the spooling speed. We integrate that and then we divide it over by the, by the cycle time. So we're using recursive least squares to update this response surface and then performing the path parameter adaptation based upon that. Now, this iterative learning, which is shown in the green box up here, has to hook in with that hierarchical time domain controller that I talked about before. So what the iterative learning is doing is updating a bunch of basis parameters that describe the figure eight that we're trying to fly. Those get converted into waypoints and those waypoints define that path geometry that previously came out of nowhere. In this case, we're interested in the azimuth sweep. That's essentially the width of the path. The elevation sweep, essentially the height of the path, the, the center elevation where the path is at. And then we're keeping the elevator deflection for this work constant, although we'll see some work where we vary that in a moment. So what you can see here are some simulation results. These are simulation results of flow speed of a meter and a half per second, 125 meters of tether. Um, the kite is flying intracycle figure eights. You can see them over here. And, and what you see on the right is the cycle average power for each cycle or each iteration. And you can see the increase from just over 20 kilowatts to, by the time this is over, about 40 kilowatts. Yep. How are you determining the tension here? 
I mean, is the, you said it's spooling in and out at the depths, yep. right? So how is the tension being produced? Is, is, it, is it spooling around some kind of a uh, uh, recoil spring or is it driving a generator? I mean, What's driving, it's driving a generator at the winch. So the generator is actually probably going to be applying uh, a, a, a pretty steady constant torque superimposed on an oscillatory torque. The, well, the, so the generator, the generator is generally speed controlled. Um, and so it's controlling the spool out speed to a particular value. Okay, I see, but, but oh, oh, all right, go ahead. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll ask my question again. But, but yeah, so the, but, so the generator is applying whatever torque it needs in order to achieve the, the required spool out speed and spool in speed. And that will be an oscillatory torque. Because of the flat fact that you're you're flying in the figure eights. Yeah. So this uh this this set of plots here shows uh, the same thing uh, just in two different visualizations. This is a plot of the cycle average power as a function of time, and this is as a function of the cycle number. So what you can see here is a visualization of the increase in power output as as we're flying cycle after cycle. Um, and if you look really closely at this, what you can see is the stair steps vary a little bit in width. In particular, they get shorter as we get further into the simulation. The reason being the kite is flying faster. So it's flying laps, flying cycles that are of similar length, but it's flying them faster and, uh, and, and therefore the cycles themselves are shorter. So the second challenge, this is the longitudinal control challenge. And that was, well, how do we control that angle of attack profile? Theoretically, we know what the optimal angle of attack should be, but that's from a quasi-static analysis. Um, and furthermore, in order to figure out that optimal angle of attack, we really have to have an excellent model of the fluid dynamic properties of the kite. So can we use cycle-to-cycle -cycle learning to optimize this profile? By the way, the, the last challenge that we sometimes face is we may not have a great model of great measurements of the angle of attack at all. And so what we've done in some recent work is rather than optimizing the angle of attack profile uh, using a model, we optimize the elevator deflection profile. It's an open loop profile, but our longitudinal dynamics are open loop stable. Um, that avoids the need for an angle of attack measurement. And we use iterative learning to avoid the need for a perfect model of the lift and drag characterization. So here's how the basic block diagram looks. Um, we're gonna take our, our control variable as an elevator deflection sequence. So we're defining a sequence of elevator deflections over a single cycle. Um, and as a result of this elevator deflection sequence, we're gonna end up with a kite speed sequence. The kite is going to be at a certain speed at each point on the cycle. Now, what we do, in our work is we define a switching objective function here. Um, the kite has some rated power and it does no good to produce mechanical power above that rated power. And so what we want to do if we're at that point is we wanna actually curtail the motion of the kite, curtail the angle of attack of, of the kite such that we're producing a mechanical power as close as possible to that rated power so as not to overload the kite. So that's the case if we estimate that our available power exceeds the rated power. Our objective function is a tracking objective function. But, but if we are in a below rated regime here, our objective function is an economic objective function where we want to maximize the kite speed. Quick comments about that. You know, one might, one might immediately think, well, wait, why not just try to track rated power all the time, even when you're not able to actually track the rated power? The challenge with that if we were to use this formulation down here all the time, even if the rated power is not in fact trackable, is what we'll see very clearly on the next slide is that our ILC law for this objective function here is gonna be driven by an error between the rated power and the achieved power. And so if we're in a situation where, uh, for example, our rated power is 100 kilowatts, but we can only achieve 50 kilowatts and we are at our optimal angle of attack profile, we are achieving 50 kilowatts. Well, there's gonna be an error and ILC is going to make an adjustment there. We don't want ILC to make an adjustment in that circumstance because we're operating at our optimum. Um, from a geometric perspective, this is just a situation where in this scenario here, 
we have an interior optimum. And in this scenario here, there's a boundary optimum and we need it. We need the switching objective function in order to get the ILC to work. So, so here's the idea. That's the three-step process. We do a trajectory linearization at each cycle and then a lifting operation. So we linearize the kite dynamics around the trajectory. And then the idea of the lifted system representation from iterative learning literature is this is a representation by which we relate the sequence of outputs over an iteration to the sequence of inputs over the same iteration through a lifted system matrix, and that matrix is G. That happens after we do the linearization. Once we've done that lifting, what we can do based on those objective functions is actually derive closed form update laws for each of those two circumstances, the below rated power and the at or above rated power. Um, and then the only thing that we need to do next, which is still important, uh, once we've got these update laws here, is we need to recognize that we could be speeding up or slowing down as we're flying these laps. As we're changing our angle of attack controller, we are either going faster or slower, depending on how we change the angle of attack. That's the whole purpose of changing the angle of attack controller. And so what we need to do is we need to map the control sequence that comes out of this ILC update to spatial positions on the path and that's what we do with this what's called path segment lookup so what my student has done so far is he's, at, he's actually applied this to an airborne wind energy system so this is the one set of simulation results that are shown for a wind energy system um, but the idea is the same and this was a system here with a rated wind speed of 10 meters per second and a rated power of 10 kilowatts a small small turbine here so what you're looking at here is a plot of power versus cycles at a 10 meter per second wind speed and a seven meter per second wind speed. And you can see at the 10 meter per second wind speed, we're tracking the rated power. This is our mechanical power output and we're tracking rated. We're maximizing our power output at the seven meter per second. If you dig a little bit under the hood, what you can see in this set of plots here, as you can see the angle of attack profile and you can see the corresponding elevator deflection profile uh, over the last lap. So that's the converged lap. And, and one of the interesting things you can see here is that the lower wind speed, you're flying at a higher angle of attack. Now that makes sense. It's at the lower wind speed when you're not trying to curtail in order to stay at rated power. At the lower wind speed, you're trying to maximize your power output. Whereas at the 10 meter per second wind speed, you're already at rated power. So you fly at a lower angle of attack profile. And by the way, one, one other thing you can see is the angle of attack profile is not constant over the iterations, even though a quasi-static analysis would suggest that, yeah. So it seems like you, in the first scenario, you could produce more power than 10 kilowatts if you wanted to. Is that correct? It's mechanical power, though, that we're plotting, yes. But if you have, so if your system is rated to 10 kilowatts of power, that means your electrical system is only gonna be able to deliver you 10 kilowatts of power. So if you don't curtail the motion of the kite, then what you're going to be doing is you're going to be dissipating power as heat, which is a problem. But the, the bigger problems, particularly with the kite system, is you're subjecting the system to increased structural loading. And, and that's really a key because increased structural loading means you need a bigger tether, a thicker tether to accommodate it. Thicker tether means that you're going to have more tether drag. More tether drag means you're not going to be able to fly as fast in the first place. So that's, that's why it's critical. And by the way, there's a one-to-one there's a -one analogy between this and blade pitch control that's done above rated wind speed for traditional tower turbines as well. Last challenge, and this is the spooling challenge. When do you spool out? When do you spool in? How fast do you spool out? How fast do you spool in? So this is the one challenge that we actually didn't turn to learning control, at least not entirely to learning to address. Um, so one of my students, a um, very clever student, was able to take a look at the dynamic model and say that even though the dynamic model is very complex, from a spooling perspective, the critical variables to understand power output are the tether tension, at least mechanical power output, or tether tension and the spooling speed. And as it turns out, the tether tension can reasonably be modeled for a given angle of attack controller as a function of the spool speed and as a function of the path variable as you fly along a figure eight. So a couple of explanations here in terms of this graph. So the path variable as I fly a figure eight goes from zero to one. 
as you might imagine, the valleys in this path here correspond to the edges of the figure eight, the peaks correspond to the, the centers of the figure eight, the straightaways. Um, and what we're looking at, at is tension versus spooling speed and path variable. Now, you got some odd shapes going on in, in this graph here. Um, so it looks like, generally speaking, the tension drops off as the spooling speed increases. By the way, a positive spooling speed is spooling out, negative spooling speed is spooling in. So the tension is decreasing as you're spooling out, and that makes sense. As you're spooling out, the kite is seeing less flow. And, and because of that, you're going to get less tension. But you do get this odd discontinuity here. And the reason for this discontinuity is you're intentionally changing your angle of attack between when you're spooling out and spooling in. When you spool out, you're flying at a very high angle of attack to generate as much tension as you can. When you spool in, you're lowering your angle of attack. And so because of that intentional switch, you see this discontinuity here. So it turns out by generating this, this model here, this static meta model, we were able to take our complex kite model and actually come up with a one state model plus the surface here where a one state variable is the tether length. And we were able to apply something called Pontryagin's maximum principle. Some of you might be familiar with that from your optimal control course. And we we're actually able to, to derive a nice result. You could actually derive it by hand um, from setting up the state and the co-state equation, computing the Hamiltonian and applying Pontryagin's maximum principle. And so there's a there's an interesting graphical approach to uh, graphical interpretation of this. So a key result of this is something that's called the co-state, which is the mathematical equivalent or analogy to the Lagrange multiplier in continuous time optimal control is constant over the course of a figure eight cycle. And it has units of tension. It turns out that the co-state physically can be interpreted as a tension threshold. And, and what you can do is take a slice of that surface that I just showed you. And if you take a slice of that surface, you get a curve. You can see that curve over here. Well, it turns out, given the value of that co-state, what you can do is you can draw two rectangles for any one of these slices. Each rectangle is going to have an origin at zero spooling speed and that co-state value. And one of the rectangles is going to have an opposite vertex that's at a positive spooling speed the other one an opposite vertex at a negative spooling speed. It turns out that the rectangle with maximum area is going to represent the optimal control strategy at any given time. So at this particular time, and this corresponds to a pretty high tension portion of the flight path, the best thing to do is spool out. This rectangle is much bigger. And the best spool out speed is right over here. And if on the other hand, we look at a portion of the figure eight that's in one of these valleys here, the best thing to do is spool in, and here is the optimal spool in speed. One little caveat about this approach is that uh, the, the continuous time optimal control solution tells you that this critical tension is constant. Turns out it doesn't tell you what the value of that critical tension is. So the reason that you get this constant critical uh, tension in this strategy is because there's a constraint in this optimization formulation that says that you have to have zero net spooling over a figure eight cycle. You can't continuously be creeping out tether or creeping in tether. So what happens is if you set this thing too high, then you're gonna be spooling in all the time. If you set it too low, you're gonna be spooling out all the time. And what we do is we combine this optimal control with an iterative learning law that adjusts our estimated value of the co-state based upon how much we've spooled tether out, knowing that the correct value of the co-state is the one that achieves zero net spooling. Here's some of the results that we get, we get. So here's an optimal spool speed profile at a particular flow speed and tether length. And here's the corresponding net energy um, versus time and a comparison to just a heuristically tuned strategy. So you can see in this case, um, it's about a 26% improvement. We looked at a number of cases, saw between 15 and 45% improvement. So that's the, those are the control strategies we've addressed. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm very proud of in our lab is that, you know, I like to say we don't just validate things against the world of MATLAB and Simulink. We validate things against the real world as well. And we do a lot of experimental work. And, and I know I only have a little bit of time, but I do want to touch upon some of the experimental work we've done. Um, so one thing that we've developed in our lab is we've developed a a progressive series of experimental platforms that allow us to go from very simple 
testing in a water channel of 3D printed tethered models of these underwater tethered systems, kites in the case of this presentation, but we've actually looked at a number of, of tethered systems using these platforms, to an intermediate setup here, which is a pool scale tow testing platform where we've uh, built this custom platform where we tow a raft along the length of the NC State pool. Uh, this allows us to test larger prototypes. It allows us to test prototypes that are controlled through control surfaces rather than over here where they're controlled via tethers um, and allows us to validate some of the control algorithms. Doesn't give us a whole lot of tow length. And that brings me to our last mechanism of our experimental validation, which is open water validation, where we've instrumented a test vessel that was, uh, that was supplied to us uh, in collaboration with the Coastal Studies Institute of, uh, of uh, East Carolina University. You can see the tow vessel over here. We've instrumented it with a winch system and a boom system and a lot of electronics inside. And we can test some of those learning control algorithms on a longer fetch. In fact, we're able, we towed this, uh, this is a picture of us towing in Lake Norman of North Carolina. We got a permitted section of the lake that's got a, more than a, a five mile fetch. So we could tow for well over an hour at a time and, and test those learning controllers. So just wanted to show you a few of our experimental results. What you can see here is some of our water channel results. You also get to hear the water channel. So you get the full experience of being there. Um, what you can see here is the biggest, the, the, Biggest advantage of the water channel is we can very quickly 3D print, tether, and fly these devices. We have a motion capture system that allows us um, to use those images in real time to capture roll pitch yaw and positions and do close loop control with tethers. This is just a comparison uh, between the model and the data in terms of roll, the lateral position, and the lateral velocity of the kite. And you can see a couple of the cameras over here. This is a, a, a back view camera in a periscope inverted periscope, and this is a side view camera over there. In the pool scale setup, uh, you saw the picture of it before, but this sort of breaks down the setup. So we have this catamaran style raft that acts as the tow mechanism. We have winch, a winch system, actually two winches, which allows us to actually tow the raft at a different speed than we spool in the kite if we want. So we have a winch system on the pool deck um, and then a retrieval frame that provides sufficient tension. We use something called a line angle sensor to measure the position of the kite. So if we know the angle, basically there's two rotary encoders on here. If we know the angle that this boom is, is making and we know how much tether is deployed, we know where the kite's at. Of course, we have an IMU on the kite that's measuring the orientation. Nice thing about the pool scale experiments is we can get cool videos out of them. Also, Every Wednesday when we went to the pool, I had an opportunity to get some exercise. This is a student who's swimming this time, but uh, a lot of the times it was me in the water. I didn't cheat and wear fins either when I, uh, <clears throat> when I was in the water, but you can see it doing figure eight motions. You get about three figure eights. So you can get into a steady figure eight profile, but you certainly can't do learning control, at least not in a continuous fashion in the pool. One thing we were able to do in the pool is we were able to, under our target flight controller, compare the experiments against the simulations. And you see that comparison in terms of we're looking at elevation angle, azimuth angle. This is what's called velocity augmentation. How much faster is the kite fl flying than it's being towed? This is the cube of that because it drives power. And let me just say a little bit about our open water experiments. This is where we actually validated the iterative learning. Um, so you can see an exploded view of the test vessel over here, the CAD rendering of the test vessel. The, the winch system is on the roof deck, uh, on the, uh, roof deck of the, the vessel. We have a boom running along the side here, um, a flow sensor, and then the line angle sensor going to the kite. And then all our instrumentation is inside. It's kind of an eerie thing doing these tests because um, you really don't have a lot of water clarity in Lake Norman. So once that thing is more than about a meter underwater, this screen is all that's telling you what's going on with the kite and the data that you get when it comes back up. What we're looking at here is a progression of cycle average power using that iterative learning approach to optimize the path parameters from the first cycle to, in this case, we ran 26 cycles. Um, again, the stair step plot, each stair step represents one cycle. And one of the key drivers of, of power is tension. So it's interesting to look, this is the spool out portion of the profile. This is the spool in. 
And you can see a, a marked increase in the tension during particularly the spool out profile. This is a comparison, by the way, same power plot here. This is a comparison of the flight paths in terms of the elevation, which is latitude, the azimuth, which is longitude between the first and the last cycle over here. Um, now, of course, I'm sure you're all super thrilled with the 17 watts of power that we're generating in the lake. Um, so, you know, we have to ask a couple of other questions in order for this to really be meaningful. One is, well, we're flying a very small kite. That's why we generate not a lot of power. Well, how does our power output compare against simulation? Well, it turns out we get pretty accurate agreement. The black is the experiment. The blue is the simulation result. We can spool in and spool out. Tensions on the right. The other thing is, if our model is accurate, well, how does that model project that the kite will perform at a larger scale? And this is where things do get meaningful. So those tens of watts at small scale in the lake translate to hundreds, about 200 kilowatts on spool out for the full scale kite, same dimensions as I showed earlier, um, at a two meter per second flow speed. And you can see the corresponding tensions. Instead of being hundreds of newtons, they're 300, 350 kilonewtons tension. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge a number of sponsors here, a number of collaborators, and I really appreciate, again, the invitation to be here. It's been great visiting again. Um, great seeing everyone. Thanks, everyone, for your attention, and happy to take any questions. Yeah, Pete. Speaking to the last slide and like the scaling up. So I'm wondering, you know, when you go from like a small scale wind turbine to a full scale, then you get aeroelastic effects. So what's your expectation if you go from the scale you're going at to like a fuller scale? Is that yeah. gonna matter or no? Well, so so certainly the uh, the environment the Density of the environment and the fact that we're structurally building the system to be neutrally buoyant in that environment allows us to to certainly not see the sort of wingtip deflections in terms of the percent uh, wingtip as a percentage of span that you would see in a in a turbine blade. Um, and furthermore, our aspect ratios are lower, but it's still a consideration. And we we actually have a collaborator that that I'm working with, Matt Bryant over at uh, NC State, who's looking precisely at, at aeroelasticity. So we're building up a model whereby we take the structural, uh, the structural characterization of the wing. Um, in real time, we use that to calculate a deflection profile, a tip deflection. And we use that to adjust the, uh, the hydro coefficients that we're using in the model. Something that we're, something that we're looking at, uh, at right now though, in our modeling work. I had a question for you. Yeah. So and there's some there's an aspect of this that I'm not sure I quite get. So so in when you're uh you, you broke this down into three control or yep. the challenges, right? Yep. So there's the there's the path, there's determining the path. Yep. And that was one of the challenges. And then another one was deciding uh about uh uh the the spooling. But of course, yep. the spooling depends on the path. Yep, the coupling, the coupling right. question, right? So, yeah. So, so yeah. I guess I guess I'm not sure how those are separate. Yeah. It, it seems like as soon as you decide what the path is, you kind of determine what the spooling is. Uh, is that not true? Um, well, that's it's it's certainly not true that uh, that one is constrained by the other. Um, but there is coupling between the between the problems. Uh, at, because it seems to me that, like uh, you know, when you're when you're prescribing, you're 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 looking at like, okay, I want to spool in here, I want to spool out there. Well, that that changes. I mean, it, it, I, I guess it, it, it determines how how slack the uh, the cable is, as well as how far away the kite is. How do you a, a little bit so uh so it has a little bit of influence on the 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 curvature of the cable but uh but the curvature put it this way um the so the tether lengths that we need to operate on a radius a sphere radius of say 300 meters are going to be on the order of anywhere between about 300 and 305 meters so in other words the the radius of the sphere that we're operating on is extremely close to the tether length that we're operating on. There is a curvature that's associated with so the tether, but it's strong coupling between 
between the pathogens and ultimately because you're prescribing displacement or the the, the, the uh, uh, displacement yeah. for the, 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 the spool. Yeah. If, so if it really is a, if it's a, if it's a top tether, then yeah. if you're just relying on the nonlinear elasticity of the tether to give you that that flexibility between the two, right? Well, you're spooling out and you're spooling in. Yeah. Um, but just geometrically, if the tether was completely rigid, one would determine the other, right? If the, if the tether didn't have any elasticity to it, then as soon as you determine the well, path, the the well, if the tether didn't have any elasticity, then the path radius would determine the tether length. But when we're when we're adjusting the path parameters, we're not adjusting path radius, so we're adjusting the path elevation sweep, the path azimuth sweep. Okay. And path. yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, it's not the path radius, but you are right that um, if you look at the meta model plot, what any of these plots, this plot here is a plot for a particular path. So if I change the path, for example, if I made the path extremely well, wide, these okay, valleys right. would get like, okay. all right, yeah. So, so you specify the path, then you get this plot. This plot is, a, is specific to the path, correct. This path. Correct, right. So it's kind of not totally, it's not totally optimal because if you're applying Pontryag into this plot, if you had changed your path, then it you would change. change. It would change the plot. Yeah, and that coupling analysis is something that we're still okay. you know, right. we're still looking. At. Yeah, but in terms of the radius, that's that's not part of the plot. I have other questions, but we're oh, I see my line. Is there anybody else? So. In the challenge, then you have this hierarchical control, right? So, is it like a multi rate control, like where you have each hierarchy at a different sampling? Yeah. I, I'm sorry, uh, what, what's the question? It's true that so, so for the path following, we have hierarchical control. And is it like a multi rate control, like each, each hierarchy has a, is at a different sampling rate? We actually, so we're actually sampling at the same rate at each, uh, at, at each level. Uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not a multi rate. Now the the time scales the the time scales of the dynamics that we're trying to address at each level are different time scales. We're not using a different sampling rate for the implementation. I'm be respectful of everybody's time. It is four thirty three. So let's thank Chris again for coming out. Thank you. Sure, uh, he'll be happy to stick around if uh, people like me have more questions. <laughs>